an LP of gentle English parlour poetry, written and recited by Stuart Henderson. Mr. Henderson's first piece is entitled, And I Received a Vision. And I received a vision from the great god, Nivea, and he said, Go, venture forth from the land of high-rise Sahara, the concrete swamp, and come to the place named Blackpool. And I went, and I lay myself prostrate on the sand and worshipped, and my eyes were dim, for behold, I'd forgotten to take off my Polaroids. And I brought Nivea gifts and laid them before him, a hamburger wrapped in grease and mustard, a bottle of lemonade that tasted like a sauna bath, and it came to pass that other flip-flop worshippers joined me, and we waited upon Nivea on the steamy, sweating beach. And after some hours I arose, and my skin had become like a dried prune, and my face resembled a new cricket ball, and my body felt like it was run on North Sea gas, and I lay myself down on a bed of calomile and was thirsty, and Nivea answered, saying, Things go better with croaks. And I screamed greatly when people slapped me on the back, and my soul was in torment, not to mention my legs and my chest. And behold, Nivea came to me and said, Which son wilt thou worship? A pair of rubber gloves picked me up and allowed me to dangle by my ankles. I swayed like an unpeeled banana and was then slapped in a most peculiar place, my mother told me, so as life's breath could slowly slither into my jelly lungs. I gave a completely convincing performance of confusion, agony and terror. Now, when gangsters, saying they are people, spike me with their looks, or shoot dum-dum bullet-shaped words into my body, which explode inside and make rather a mess. Though they don't leave a mark on my face, I feel again I'm swaying in space and being slapped in a most peculiar place. My garden used to look ever so nice. It had pretty little birds that sang pretty bird songs and flowers that swayed gently when I stroked their petals. It had a sun that made my cheeks go red. There were hedges with ledges, green trees with bees. The soil was the kind that sparrows continually bathed in, their feathers sifting through the fine earth like spaghetti sieves through a fork. There was a dairy at the bottom of my garden, where I could drink warm, fresh milk from fat, udded cows. The worms were big, fat, I was going to say juicy, but never having squeezed one, I wouldn't know. Oh, what a joyous garden it was, but like this poem, it is now in the past tense. My garden had no boundaries, for one day, across the great artistic pastures, all manner of odd creatures came. Like sloths, or for that matter porridge, they slopped all over my garden. One, with the aid of a mechanical shovel, started to build a motorway. Not wishing to cause offence, I let the matter lay by. Another of the creatures, with a talking machine hanging from his lapel, asked me what I grew in my garden, and when I said grass, he promptly arrested me. And in an instant, there was a symphony of airport runways, holiday inns, wimpy bars, Jimmy Young. And now, when I dream, it's of giant hamburgers with wings stamped BOAC coming towards me saying, what's the recipe today, Stu? But sometimes, amongst the cacophony, of ugly shapes and hideous colours, I see a garden that used to look ever so nice.
a man, not aware of madness, wandered into the rush hour, holding a red carnation. He boarded the train and hunched himself around the flower like a cloud. What redness, what perfection, he praised, fondling the bud delicately to his tired Macintosh. The train panted along in numerical sequence. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, two, three, four. Businessman, weary after a hard day's lusting at the office, and typists, their nails chipped and tights torn, got in and out of compartments like clockwork cattle, and soon there were many, all knowing what it felt like to be toothpaste. The man tried to protect his flower, but people blew smoke rings that spelt couldn't care less, as the carnation gasped for breath, amidst the crush, it was crushed, and the man whimpered his way off the train, passengers giggled their way past him, as he sat on the stairs outside the station, with sellotape and sorrow in his hand, trying to repair his little piece of God. You are as inevitable as morning and you are there long before the first woodbine croak is heard at the blurry-eyed bus stops of the city. You watch and wonder as the sound of waking mumbles its chorus across rooftops. You see and hear lovers readjust their dreams in the not-quite-right of day. You listen to the out-of-tune clatter of newspapers, drowning out the concert pitch spot-on of the trees. This is a tired morning as street sweepers clock on. We have stolen it from you and fashioned it in our own image. You have not yet charged us with theft, and when you do, our defence will be inadequate. The dog ends in the gutter have no apologies written on them. There are no acknowledgments in the personal columns. The milk bottles hold no thank you notes, and the morning yawns steadily onwards. The morning that is not ours, but always yours. Your face, my love, is as whole as a slice of cucumber, with clouds like bunches of watercress swirling round your mouth. I will bring you gifts of tomatoes, lettuce, trip into an asparagus dream, and I will kiss away your book teeth caused by eating too many carrots. And you, you in turn will bring me an organic rice butty, and we shall sit beneath the shade of a cauliflower, writing fan letters to gardeners question time. And like Romeo and Juliet, we shall make a pact, an OD on Greenfly, and the earth shall bury us.
I don't want a splintered messiah in a sweat-stained, greasy grey robe. I want a new one. I couldn't take this one to parties. People would say, who's your friend? I'd give an embarrassed giggle and change the subject. If I took him home, I'd have to bandage his hands. The neighbours would think he's a football hooligan. I don't want his cross in the hall. It doesn't go with the wallpaper. I don't want him standing there like a sad ballet dancer with holes in his tights. I want a different messiah, streamlined and inoffensive. I want one from a catalogue who's as quiet as a monastery. I want a package tour messiah, not one who takes me to Golgotha. I want a king of kings with blow waves in his ear. I don't want the true Christ. I want a false one. This was the scene. Her eyes were as big as sad marbles, the memories all too distinct. She took her past, wrapped in flimsy brown paper, and in hope placed it before them. Some of them wrote books, and on their tax forms where it said occupation, they put teachers, learned men, Having heard what she had to say, they readjusted their spectacles and scurried to their notebooks, Bibles, dictionaries, anything that would help relieve their embarrassed ignorance. They decided to compare notes and asked her if she would wait. All part of the routine was the explanation they gave. So she went away and waited. Several days later they sent their reply and the postmark said guilty. So, teachers, learned men, on behalf of her I am writing this get well poem to you. To write of love is a strange affair. It can be worn like a watch chain, precise yet unimaginative. It can take on a disguise and be given out at Christmas. Dear Auntie Ada, thank you for the hanky you sent me. It was just what I wanted. Oh my love. It can save itself till the last dance of the party and then, bathed, perfumed and eyebrow plucked, caress and kiss with the utmost sincerity and all this between the first verse and the chorus it can be offered by nations towards their fellow man however this gift should be suspended when planting minefields it can be ignored at crucifixions it can be trampled underfoot at weddings in the rush for a free sherry and a ritz cracker with a prawn on top it can pinprick the sky with stars and then wait for scientists to come up with a more substantial explanation. To write of love is a strange affair. I die now, at this dreadful place, with rusted bones and weeping wounds. My lips, like shredded wax, crave frantically for moisture. This body soon will cease to be a sad example of my children's work. For these eyes are clear, though my voice is hushed. 
And I see not just my darling city with its aching faces. Those expressions are familiar. They will wander through church hall jumble sales, stutter onto trains during rush hours. They will sit attentively chatting amicably at a coffee morning in Rochdale. They will explain away death as a heartbeat gone wrong. They will crawl through other cities and their souls will become silent beggars and only some will regard me as their eternal oasis. O oh, aching faces, this dreadful place is for you. I'm dousing myself with cosmetics to stop me from smelling quite strong. Max Factor Gillette, I've tried them all yet, I'm convinced that something is wrong. I go into Boots every Wednesday, the assistants are ever so nice. And there I buy Brute to make me feel cute and soap that helps to kill lice. Yet still I can smell this foul odour that somehow I cannot explain. I even tried Vim, my future looks dim, cause now I just foam when it rains. So dear Estee Lauder, do tell me, when my body is clean and hair dyed, it must be a phase, please help me erase the sweat stain that lies deep inside. Between the crack, rap, snap of a rifle shot and the before falling bullet bound body, there was a space. I had two alternatives. A numbness, or the thought of a car backfiring. If it was the former, it wasn't true. It's that Reginald Bosenket's fault with his vivid imagination. Oh God, turn over to Z cars before I believe him. If it was the latter, then there's a hole in the exhaust. Went on, read me poems, got laughs where people were supposed to laugh, came off, got changed. Soldier shot, signed a few autographs through the head, felt pleased, dead. Roadblocks on the way out of Derry, and the reins dressed for a funeral, crying down the windscreen. Without any warning, and my bed still warm from the tossings of my callous dreams, I, with the sun melting my dirty window, walk downstairs to find a sparrow crying on my doorstep. At such an early hour, I still manage to summon pity from my misty thoughts. I asked him to come inside and share cornflakes, but he was only able to whimper. So I picked him up, taking care not to bruise his feathers. I placed him on the table next to the sugar bowl and attempted self-conscious chats about world events. He asked for a cup of milk and I willingly obliged. What do I say next? Make him laugh with an ill-timed joke? Ask him about his family? Or does possessing a beak give one a new outlook? Meanwhile, he had sunk his head into the milk and not looking up, quenched his thirst with a frenzy of hurried gulps. Shall I ask him if he's homeless or will that rekindle memories of once lived in nests and trees that sheltered better times? I refrained from such insensitive approaches and smiled, hoping he would accept my simple fumblings. After making several apologies about the state of his appearance, he quietly slipped out of the back door and into the garden, where he said he felt more comfortable. I wished him goodbye 
and went back to my toast and marmalade and began to feel annoyed at the droppings he had left behind. Four years old, and though her face rarely betrays, her thoughts are full of gasps. She turns round to lick the sun, disguised as a giant ice cream, but bruises her lips on a parking meter. I did not grow up in such a place. She has to. She disappears down the steps of the subway, trying hard to equate fairy tales with juggernauts. I will her to emerge on the other side of the road, and as her small body glances past the Kentucky Fried Chicken, I hope her dreams are of castles and heroes. I would now like to write a surrealist artist's competition poem. I drew a blank. It won first prize. Thank you. that Solzhenitsyn discovered the truth had finally been raped to death. I was writing a letter to the manufacturers to tell them that my pipe had got woodworm and please could I have my money back. When he sat alone in his Moscow flat, listening to his own breathing and waiting for footsteps, I was annoyed because I bought a carton of cream that was two days old and I couldn't make myself a decent Gaelic coffee. Whilst the KGB were doing a brilliant impression of the Hound of the Baskervilles, I was checking the bill suspiciously in a cheap curry house. CP Lau Rice has gone up another five pence. On the day that Frieden was dragged naked and bleeding through Red Square, I pulled faces at God, because it was raining again. Whose idea of fun is a nightmare? Who invented holiday camps, then sent Adolf a five-year lease? Who giggles like a child when death is mentioned? Who giggles like death when a child is mentioned? Who sent Caiaphas an estimate for the cross? Who made the Ouija board just another party game? Who tried to put God out of a job? Who whistles if I rule the world? that makes everything go black.